avocado but, 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 but is I... native for yeah. great big rock, rock, rock. Hey, you geeks. Two years ago, I received this copy of Bruegel's painting of the Tower of Babel. And I learned that this painting is also for <clears throat> those who are really, really cool might recognize it as the cover art of the 2001 masterpiece, Sid Meier's Civilization III. And we all know how much Brandon Sanderson loves his video games. Well, I can barely manage a game of Mario Kart. <laughs> So I figured that the best use of my talents would be to dig into the actual civilizations and look at their tellings of the story of the Tower of Babel to understand what tropes and morals the ancient authors used to convey the point and see how Sanderson may have incorporated those already into the Stormlight Archive on his way to for some reason, spoiler warning, placing the long-awaited duel of the champions on the tower's roof, where I still fear your Thiru may crumble. Ones who babble. Language and writing have been essential to the telling of the Stormlight Archive since the beginning, from men's cultural taboo of literacy to Dalinar's visions being used to eventually decode the Dawn chant, Sanderson has made linguistics plot relevant in a way that not even Tolkien dared. Going back to the way of kings when Dalinar had to have Navani scribe for him. I wrote down everything as best I could that you babbled today. This is not gibberish, but it's no language that people now speak. I suspect it is what it seems, the Dawn chant. So unless you can think of another way your father learned to speak a dead language, Adolin, the visions are most certainly real. Babbling is not a common word like undulate in the Stormlight Archive. In fact, in the Way of Kings, only two people are said to babble. Dalinar and Taravangian. This may be a coincidence, but the next time Taravangian is said to babble in words of radiance, it's when he's composing the diagram. He'd spent the day staring at a wall. He'd written on it, babbling the whole time, making connections no man had ever before made. He'd scribbled all over his wall, floor, and even parts of the ceiling he could reach. Most of it had been written in an alien script. Between literally writing the future on the wall in an alien script and babbling the whole time, I am getting strong Babylon, Tower of Babel subtext from this passage here. I can read the writing on the wall. So I don't think it's a coincidence that no one babbles in Rhythm of War as at that point, Eurotheru has become a true tower of unity. With the Oath Gates providing direct access to cities around the continent, Eurotheru could grow to be cosmopolitan. She saw not only the uniforms of seven different princedoms, but people wearing the patterns of three Makabaki local governments, Thalen merchants and Luli soldiers, and Nat and tradesmen were all represented. There were even a few human Aemeans. Thus, I think it's fair to examine the Stormlight Archive not only as a modern Western epic successor to the classics, but also reaching back into ancient Mesopotamian history and the epics that told the story of the origination of language itself, which is a actual genre beyond Genesis. <sighs> And they have a few key tropes that relate to your theory. Of course! The first one being the tower. Fans have already asked Sanderson if your theory is a spaceship. Is your theory a spaceship? 
It is not. Good question. It's a new theory. They're thinking it's one of the floating cities from... From Ashen, yes. Boy, that would be hard. It's so big. But I suppose magic, you know, but no, it is not. That's okay. I didn't really want to build a spaceship anyway. That's cool. So, if it's not a spaceship, yet conspicuously close to the heavens, I think it's an ideal place for Team Honor to launch off from in the back five to go to war with the gods. Team Rocket, blast off at the speed of light! Surrender now or prepare to fight! Which is where the Tower of Babel trope comes in. For before it was a byword for incomprehensible speech, its stated goal was to reach the heavens themselves. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Archaeologists have found such boasts at the base of ancient ziggurats in Mesopotamia, such as the one that stood in ancient Babylon, named Etamenanki, which name literally translates to the Temple of the Foundation of Heaven and Earth. Now, that ziggurat is no longer standing, despite Nebuchadnezzar's best attempt at restoring it. However, there is still one standing at Ur, which I'm sure is a complete coincidence for Stormlight Archive fans. The stones whispered to her that the place had once been called Ur. The word meant original in the dawn chant, an ancient place with ancient stones. Thus, the oh-so-helpful stones of Roshar's Ur seem to confirm the ziggurat tie-in I'm seeing here while also drawing a crucial distinction. For the Tower of Babel, notably, was made on the plains of Shinar, whereas ur Thiru was formed from a mountain. The mountain. Now, when I first saw Eurythiru as a ten-tiered mountain with a flat top where one could converse with the divine, I saw Mount Purgatory, which I still see, especially through F-Face's perspective, because the man is pridefully carrying a huge stone, and who else does that? But I don't see this influence as being exclusive. Rather, I see it tying in neatly with the Sumerian epics of Enemarkar and his attempts to deal with the Lord of Arata and build a tower to reach the heavens. Now, Arata is the Sumerian equivalent of... Once upon a time, in a kingdom far, far away... And has no known geographical location. But, as a fangirl, comparing pronunciations and general vibes, it does seem suspiciously similar to the very real mountain location of Ararat, also known as Uratu, or in Semitic without the A, Urtu, which sounds suspiciously similar to Sanderson's own Urto, which is like Urtu plus water. And Ur-2 has another aquatic tie-on, as it is said to have been the mountain on which Noah's Ark rested after the flood. And from there is where Nimrod set out to go hunting wabbits. How am I ever going to catch that squooey duck? Precisely what I was wondering, my little Nimrod. And when that didn't work, Nimrod decided to build a tower with equally disastrous results, which sets him in about the same time, mythologically speaking, as Enemarkar, who is said to have been the grandfather of Gilgamesh. Enemarkar just casually had a chat with the goddess Inanna, aka Ishtar, one day, and decided that the people of Arata shall bring down the mountain stones from their mountains and shall build a great shrine for you, Inanna, and will make the 
Abu grow for you like a holy mountain, and will make Eregdu shining for you like the mountain range. Now, Earth's history is chock full of forgotten historic sites and the quest to find them, mostly by Europeans. However, I very much like the credence of the mythical land of Arata being confused with the very real mountainous location of Arat as giving another layer of historical realism to Urethiru's mysterious location. Though many wished Urethiru to be built in Alethala, it was obvious that it could not be, and so it was that we asked for it to be placed westward, in the place nearest to honor. For like Urethiru, Enemarkar's tower for Inanna, aka Ishtar, was to be a bastion of unity for the peoples like never before, as Inanna herself predicted. At such a time, the many-tongued peoples, may they all address and lil together in a single language. For at that time, Enki, the lord of abundance and steadfast decisions, shall change the speech in their mouths, as many as he had placed there, so the speech of mankind is truly one. Of course, there is just one tiny problem with this plan. Enemarkar is lord of Uruk, not Urata. This goes down just as well as you think it would, and the two challenge each other to... A duel of the champions. In a way, Enemarkar and the Lord of Arata answers my long-standing question about why Sanderson would place the duel of the champions on top of Urethiru, aside from the obvious reason. But it's gonna look really cool. For Enemarkar, although stating his intention to build a glorious tower of the gods, soon gets sidetracked as he and the Lord of Arata duke it out in words, and their catfighting gets so furious that writing is invented along the way. Because the messenger, whose mouth was tired, was not able to repeat it, Anamarkar patted some clay and wrote the message as if on a tablet, Formerly, the writing of messages on clay was not established. Now, under that sun and on that day, it was indeed so. Enemarkar inscribed the message like a tablet. Well, you can tell Ronald. I'm not an owl! So you can see how Dalinar putting down the sword for the mightier Reed is truly of epic proportions, reaching back to Enemarkar, whose story is older than the word for blue. Now, now, this ancient story has several holes in it, which is infuriating for the theorizing fangirl, but I'm sure is great for contemporary authors. Although it's not complete, we still find out that it all does come to a head in a true wizard's duel. They're having a wizard's duel. What's that mean? Oh, it's a battle of wits. The players change themselves to different things in an attempt to, uh, to destroy one another. Enemarkar appoints the wise woman, Sagbaru, as his champion, and the Lord of Arata appoints another sorcerer. It comes to an end when the wise woman tells off the sorcerer. Your sin that butter and milk cannot be forgiven. Nana the king, the buyer, milk, established that it was a capital offense, and I am not pardoning your life. She threw her prisoner from the bank of the Euphrates. She seized him, his life force, and then returned to her city, Erez. Now, it hasn't escaped me that most of my and the fandom's top choices for potential champions in the duel are all men. So if Sanderson wants to pull a fast one, he could totally choose a female champion, and it wouldn't be out of the tradition's keeping 
for not only do we have wise woman Sagbaru from Enner Makar, but Beatrice is said to, in the Divine Comedy, have descended from heaven to the top of Mount Purgatory with such force that it yeeted Virgil, wily e. Coyote style, all the way back to hell. And I really want to see that happen with Dalinar. Now, if I were Sanderson transposing this story into the Stormlight Archive, I wouldn't let Team Honor be Enermarkar's side, despite their literacy, when he's already built up the powerful ba Edo Mishram as a great female antagonist, who would be righteously peeved at Team Honor for locking her away for hundreds of years and disrupting the natural order of Roshar. Now, this theory has several holes, which we will ignore in favor of the big picture. And the Mercar's tower never gets built because he is too busy fighting with the Lord of Arata. Are you so busy fighting you cannot see your own ship has set sail? This epic truly underscores how rare it is for a unifying tower like Earth they were to exist even in fantasy. For the true villains are the other people we meet along the way, and trying to get along with them is hard. It's it's difficult. Difficult. Lemon difficult. So the mythos surrounding the Tower of Babel and the Enermerkar stories is one not of the famous wrath of the Mesopotamian gods thundering down on the hapless people within, but rather one of the people dividing amongst themselves. And that seems to go better in the Eurythiru story at the time of the Recreants rather than present-day Duel of the Champions. So, it doesn't seem likely that Eurythiru will fall at the end of Book 5, and I hope it will be the launch pad into the heavens where Team Honor will rage the war of the gods. Please let me know your thoughts down in the comment section down below. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you want to see more. Bye!